A coalition aircraft has destroyed Islamic State camps in Iraq. To talk about this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me via Skype once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, this was part of the anti-ISIS coalition known as Operation Inherent Resolve. Yes, so uh, we had heard that ISIS is done, finished, complete. We're pulling out of Syria. We are kind of loosening the tentacles on Iraq. Um, but that's not the case. So the coalition has kept their eyes on the prize. They know that um, with a group like ISIS, they will just sprout up again, meaning they will multiply and grow. And that's exactly what happened when they came back onto the scene in 2014. Way before this, they were you know, an offshoot of al-Qaeda. They were able to grow in Iraq, go over to Syria, come back to Iraq. Basically, being able to dodge authorities, being able to dodge enemies, um, kind of like whack-a-mole. So they will sprout up when we're not looking. And knowing this, the coalition did exactly that. They are doing pinpointed, very targeted strikes against their major assets, their headquarters, where they're growing. And this news, amidst you know all the other things that we're all looking at domestically, like COVID, like the protests, like the statues... This came as, you know, um, a, a welcome piece of news because we do still hear about isolated um, ISIS attacks around the world so that we, we know that they have an influence and they do care to grow that influence. So when we're not looking, they will be growing. So these kinds of attacks will hopefully deter that growth and their ability and potential to um, sprout up in places where there is that political void. Now, speaking of attacks, Lisa, a 22-year-old woman was recently killed in Iran by her father for returning home late. Reports say the dad who killed his daughter with an axe called it an honor killing. Now, under, under Islamic Republic law, fathers who kill their children are not considered murderers and cannot receive the death penalty? Yeah, so at the Foreign Desk Week, this is our third honor killing in one month coming out of Iran. Wow. Um, Mind-blowing, mind-blowing. The one before this was a 13-year-old girl who ran away with her boyfriend. Um, you know, when you juxtapose the images coming out of Iran, they're not on camels. They're not primitive. These are probably young women who have Instagram accounts. These are young women who are well aware of how to use an iPhone and an iPad. Put that up against their fathers who are applying Sharia law, which is Islamic law, in the year 2020 to, you know, they call them honor killings, quote unquote, because they are trying to recover the family's honor when the daughter has done something that is deemed um, unethical in the eyes of Islam. So coming home late at night, going away with your boyfriend, having a boyfriend, you know, being intimate with a male before before marriage. Um, these are all things that would, you know, taint the family name. So they recover, so to speak, the family name by killing their daughters. To think that a, a parent could do such a thing in this day and age, it's mind-blowing. And the murders are so gruesome, using an ax in this case, very similar to the one before this and the one before that. Um, look, we also hear about these honor killings in the United States, in the West, in Europe, um, you know, they, they carry these customs with them wherever they go. They want the family name to stay pure, uh, quote unquote. And I, you know, I have a hard time saying that with a straight face because it is so disgusting. Um, and, you know, we cover these stories to bring awareness to the fact that these young women, even in their own homes, aren't finding that safety um, with, with their own parents because they're living ordinary lives of teenagers, of, of, of a woman in her 20s coming home late. You know what? We just celebrated Father's Day here in North America. Me being a father myself, my job on this earth is to protect my kids and even die for them. I mean, at all costs, protect Amen. them. Never lay exactly. a hand to hurt them. I just, I don't understand that mindset altogether. Lisa, a report by the Israel Defense Forces chief says Iran is now the most dangerous country in the Middle East and not just because of its nuclear program. Tell me more about that. Yeah, we've long said that, um, you know, it, we're, we're focusing on Iran because of its nuclear program. Um, most people don't know that Iran has long been the number one exporter of terror. It's not just their nuclear program, which some people think, oh, well, we can make a deal with them. Why not? They've been honest about their nuclear program. Um, well, when we aren't looking, Iran is doing other things. They're sending assets over to Venezuela. They're sending assets over to Gaza, to Hamas, to Hezbollah. They're propping up the Houthis in Yemen. They have their hand in Syria. They have their hand in Iraq. They have their hand in Lebanon. They have their hand in suicide bombings everywhere. 
Um, so this report came out by the IDF, by the Israel Defense Forces. Um, no surprise, because they know that they are within arm's reach of Iran, a country that not only possesses the potentiality, not only possesses uh, the, the weapons and the money that they are sending to these, um, to, to these uh, other terror organizations and individuals, but they also possess the desire to, to take Israel off the map. So combine these together, and of course, Israel has plenty of reason to worry about Iran becoming the most dangerous country in the Middle East. A man who was accused in a terror-related stabbing spree that killed three people and seriously injured three others in a British park was known to the UK counterintelligence agency, Lisa. Why weren't police keeping closer tabs on this 25-year-old suspect? Right. Don't we ask that in every single one of these cases? Don't we ask why there wasn't, um, you know, knowledge uh, or there was knowledge of this individual before him, but why there wasn't a, a close, closer tabs on him? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, these individuals that are highly, highly, highly radicalized, in this case, this was a Libyan man who have this um, ag agenda to cause terror, to cause intimidation, to, to kill um, locals. Uh, like they do in Europe, like they do here in, in North America as well, um, they go back to business as usual. So whether they have served time in prison and have been let go, they become even more radicalized sometimes in prison. We've seen that case many times here in North America, where they become either radicalized to initially or more so in prison and come out with a vengeance in order to uh, cause you know multiple deaths in, in, in a stabbing, in a car ramming, et cetera. We've seen this very often. And secondly, it, it's always 2020 retrospect. So they're looking back and saying, well, we kind of knew this guy. He was on a list. He was arrested before. He was in our possession before. But of course, with petty crimes, with little things, they're able to let them go. Now with COVID, they're releasing individuals who are even more dangerous because they don't want them in prison. Um, you know, it's a mess. It's a mess. And to look at this, these innocent lives that were lost because they were in a garden on a Sunday, it's horrific. It's really, truly horrific to think that this is still happening. U.S. President Donald Trump's longest serving national security advisor, John Bolton, condemned his presidency as damaging to the United States and argued the 2020 election is the last guardrail to protect the country from him. I'm guessing that maybe Bolton's not going to invite Trump out to the next golfing trip. This is such a, a, a frustrating story. It's such a frustrating story. I worked with John Bolton when I was at Fox News. Um, I know him pretty well. And it's upsetting to watch because this is, um, you know, a gentleman's ego match taken to the public. Uh, and that's how I see it. You know, um, what John Bolton's saying, Mike Pompeo has come out and said, most of it's not true. I was there for most of these cases and scenarios that he paints out. And his opinions are just opinions. So when we look at the facts, well, if you truly believe that Donald Trump was a danger to, to national security, what are you doing by releasing national security secrets to the public in a book? Um, you know, if you truly cared about the country and its national security, then these things should be kept secret and you should have taken them out with you from when you exited the White House. These aren't things that should now make him popular or more famous or more rich or popular among liberals. He is, you know, that's the irony of this all. When he was appointed, he was, he was in fact, uh, Donald Trump's most right-wing, most hawkish appointee. There was tremendous backlash about him being appointed. Many people on the left, center to left, were upset about him being appointed because they thought that, and he did, call for war with Iran, want them to drop bombs on Iran, and Donald Trump didn't want to do that. He wanted to be more moderate about his foreign policy regarding Iran. So it's he said, he said in this case, but um, upsetting that it is over selling books, becoming the darling of the left, which will never happen with someone like him who is as far right as, as he is. And again, at the cost of the nation, our foreign policy, our national security and our nation's secrets. Really upsetting. Lisa, U.S. President Donald Trump also says he's open to meeting with Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro to discuss the economic troubles in the Latin American nation. Now, Trump is also less than enthusiastic about his administration's decision to back opposition leader Juan Guaido. Yeah, we spoke a lot about Guaido um, here, Hal, and, uh, you know, uh, of course, we were, we were all pretty excited about the prospect of a moderate 
Western-leaning, um, non-socialist individual taking the place of Maduro, who has caused so much turmoil for the country of Venezuela. Um, at the same time, Trump is a realist, and he's thinking, well, Maduro's not going anywhere anytime soon, and I'm always open to a meeting. This is the, the businessman Donald Trump coming through. You know, in the White House, it's, you know, in politics in general, it's generally the case that if you meet with someone, it's a symbolic um, warming of ties. To Donald Trump, that's not always the case. He met with North Korean leader. He was open to meeting with Iranian leaders. He's open to meeting with anyone. It's almost like, you have a piece of property to sell me? Let's sit down. It doesn't mean I'm going to buy the piece of property from you. It doesn't mean anything. I'm willing to have a meeting. And that's exactly what Donald Trump has said about Venezuelan leader Maduro. I'm open to a meeting. And it means nothing more than that. Now, there are reports that Iran has been sending food to Venezuela to help out. What's the latest there? Yeah, so we know that it's not just food, and that's the problem. They sent oil before, and we said, well, why are they selling, sending oil? Venezuela, first and foremost, has its own oil. Secondly, the amount of oil won't really add up to much, um, even if we're talking about refined oil, which Venezuela may have more challenge getting. Um, now, food. Are you really just sending food, or are you sending other things? Um, with the relationship between Tehran and Caracas, we've always said the relationship is mutually beneficial, and it's because um, Iran is putting Hezbollah operatives in Venezuela. They're putting dual-use businesses in Venezuela. What does that mean? That it benefits not only um, you know, what may appear on the outside as an electronic shop, but inside they're selling cocaine and, and again, funneling money to Hezbollah. The significance of all of this they're at the footstep of North America, and you and I should be worried for that reason. Iran has found a very comfortable footstep, a very comfortable partner in Venezuela, in Maduro, and is beefing up its assets right below our borders. Many statues, Lisa, deemed racist are being removed throughout the United States, including a Theodore Roosevelt statue at a New York museum. There are even calls for a Gandhi statue to be removed, not in the United States, but in the UK. What is going on here? It's contagious. It's contagious. Um, yes, we are in a uh, um, a a period of change, in the period of self-reflection, and many believe that by taking down these statues, you're erasing the philosophies, the histories, the thoughts that went into uh, you know that 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 were of the past, and others who are opposed to it. Um, say, well, we have to have these statues. We have to remember this history so that we do not repeat it. We're, we shouldn't be offended by a statue that represents a certain period of time because that period of time brought us to where we are now. You know, it's almost as if, you know, you burn your childhood albums because you think, you know, you didn't have the best childhood in the world. Well, you also have those albums because you have those memories. Um, I, you know, I, I, I can see both arguments, but the destruction, the violence, the disrespect... Um, that is still going on, not only in the United States, but elsewhere. As I said, it's contagious. It's, it's spread everywhere. There are still um, protests going on in different parts of the world that were fueled by the, the, um, the protests that, that happened here with Black Lives Matter. And, you know, again, as long as there's no violence, as long as they're not desecrating property, um, in this case, even the statues, I mean, they're desecrating property. Um, there should be a conversation that is had, but to promote that violence and, um, you know, for it to be so t taking so long, it it's not going to be anything constructive for our future. Lisa, let's chat a bit about the novel coronavirus. And when it comes to the virus in the United States, more than 2.3 million Americans were infected by it, over 100,000 deaths. Now, in Brazil, that country's become the second nation to pass 50,000 deaths. Why aren't they getting ahead of the curve? Yeah, it seems like they can't catch up fast enough. Um, Brazil has, has caught itself in, in, in a bad position regarding timing. Um, they did not flatten their curve, and they also had, you know, they, they timed that along with everything reopening. So they kind of were like, okay, let's reluctantly, Spain did the same thing. Let's reluctantly start trying to open things back up. And, you know, this curve just, it, it continued to, to rise and rise and rise. So they're having a very difficult time coming off of that curve, having a very hard time flattening that curve. And they have a very hard time um, being able to administer the proper care to those who are, are, are in inflicted with this coronavirus. So, um, you know, it's going to be a while before we see those numbers go down. 
Luckily, in Italy, for example, when they had such a high curve, they were able to bring it down. So the good news and the bad news of the day, or good news being Italy, having the lowest number of deaths since March, and Brazil being the bad news of the day, having the highest number, and that number surpassing 50,000 deaths in that country already. Yeah, let's pray we can keep getting ahead of this curve here and finally knock out the coronavirus altogether. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Thank you, Lisa. My pleasure.